Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And joining us today is Jason Bell. He's a professor of philosophy at the University of New Brunswick and is here to talk about the extraordinary career of Winthrop Bell, MI6 agent and one of the first people to recognize the true horror of the Third Reich um, from, from his position in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. Um, the link to his website is in the description below. There are also links to purchasing his books in the description below, as there always are. If you're a new uh, viewer to World War II TV, that description is where you find everything you'll need, including links to our Patreon uh, our page and our YouTube channel member page. So without further ado, I'll bring Jason in. So good evening, sir. How are you today? I'm doing very well, Paul. Thanks. How about yourself? I'm very well. So I was just talking to you before going live. I have people on this channel who are proper, you know, old school military historians. I've had anthropologists. I've had people who look at sort of social history. You you teach philosophy. So I've got to kind of ask before we talk about the subject, how how did you discover this, this, this individual and how does it kind of connect with your day job? Sure. So, so my specialty as a professor of philosophy, I, I work in pragmatism and phenomenology. And I had been uh, looking for a link between these two movements when I was a graduate student. So I, I had read some pragmatism first, then I read phenomenology, and they, they sounded very much similar to me. So uh, in the year 2008, I went to the University of Göttingen in, in Germany, where one of the major figures of pragmatism had been a student in the 1870s, and then a few decades later, the founder of German phenomenology named Edmund Husserl uh, founded the, the movement called Phenomenology there. And I thought I might just find some kind of link between them, maybe something they, sh they, they read in common. Uh, I was surprised to find uh, in the last, last afternoon, the, the last hour of my research, a dissertation written on pragmatism by Winthrop Bell and directed by Edmund Husserl. So this was the missing link I had been looking for. And I was astounded about the, the Göttingen copy of the dissertation was missing two pages. And I found that Winthrop Bell's papers were housed at Mount Allison University in Eastern Canada in the province called New Brunswick, uh, but portions of, of those papers were under restriction. So I had no idea why they were under restriction, but I wrote to the president of the university and asked for permission to go in just so I wouldn't you know, waste my time. I wanted uh, the restrictions lifted. And he wrote back a couple of weeks later and he agreed to lift uh, the restrictions. He said I could come in. I, I subsequently learned that the foreign office uh, had been, the foreign office of the UK had 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 been called, and they confirmed that the, these papers were no longer under restriction. Uh, so I I went into Mount Allison in uh, 2008, and began researching these papers. And it, at first, I saw that he had done uh, political work when he was uh, when he was in France, briefed David Lloyd George and people like this. But it it was just kind of like a aha well, huh, sort of thing. I, I was really captivated at that moment with. Uh, the philosophy side of it. So, so Winthrop Bell was a very important figure for introducing phenomenology into the English language and interpreting between these two movements. Uh, and then around the year 2012, I, I started looking at the intelligence stuff uh, that he had written, and I was just completely astounded. And, and I sort of <laughs> changed everything around and, and have spent uh, the, the last decade working intensively on his uh, intelligence career. And that dovetails into me just saying, so you're going to give us a bit of a presentation about his extraordinary life. And, and I can imagine when you're writing it, it's like one of those, what do you leave out? Because <laughs> so many places, so many eras, so many fields that he was involved in. Um, but, you know, I, I, we'll, we'll hand it over to you. And folks, we'll do questions at the end from you guys, although I may jump in with a couple of comments. If you've seen Frank, the show with Frank McDonough recently about the Weimar Republic, well, that kind of is the same era and we had Katia Hoyo on of course talk about the rise of the Nazis because one of the eternal questions I think Jason attempts to answer is is when were the when was the world aware of of the rise of this movement and and what level of I guess suspicion and that was was placed on it but for that to find out the answer to that, I'm going to hand over to Jason to tell us his story. Thank you very much Paul so I'm I'm going to do my presentation in in two parts so the first part I'm going to read the prologue of my book, uh, which gives a sense of the historical scope of the story uh, and the kinds of details that you'll find in the book. And the second part, I will give an intellectual biography of Winthrop Bell with special attention to his intelligence career. Uh, so the first part is my prologue. On Sunday, March 19, 1939, Winthrop Bell opened his basement vault and stepped inside 
through an imposing green steel door designed for a bank. He lifted a file holding copies of still classified espionage reports he had written for the British Secret Intelligence Service 20 years earlier. He knew how to manage the risk. Sealed behind a massive lock, the papers were safe from thieves and Gestapo spies. In his hand were London's first warnings about the Nazis written during his mission to Berlin. He locked the vault behind him and returned to his basement study. Because he had built his house on land sloping down to the harbor, the back wall was at ground level, with two sunny windows and a door opening onto the garden. He looked out one window and took in a commanding view of Back Harbor in Chester, Nova Scotia. Bell was half a world away from the Nazis' violent, racist Berlin. 20 years earlier, the Secret Intelligence Service, better known as MI6, had sent him on a classified mission to that dangerous city teeming with democratic heroes and terroristic villains. His assignment was to gather intelligence about the situation in the German capital, where people were still licking their wounds after their defeat in the First World War. Gradually, he had gathered threads of evidence, hints from sources, and interviews with aristocrats, politicians, bureaucrats, military officers, soldiers, scientists, and ordinary citizens. Woven together, he revealed a secret group with a dangerous plot. Now, 20 years later, the terrorists controlled Germany. Bell's democratic sources had been murdered, exiled, or were working underground. In 1919, some powerful British bureaucrats had been incredulous of Bell's warning. The Nazis were, at the time, attacking Jews from the shadows and weren't perceived as a threat. Officials decided to bury Bell's report under a restrictive top-secret classification rather than release it to the public, as he had hoped. Two decades later, he still kept a copy in his vault. The other copy was stored in the Foreign Office's secret library. By the spring of 1939, the Nazis had grown strong enough to plot a war of revenge against the entire world. But they kept their plan and their ultimate purpose the Holocaust, as we now call it, as their most closely guarded secret. Bell was the first to decipher their code, just as he had been in 1919. He knew he needed to put his retirement on hold so he could thwart the Nazis once again. Bell added his 20-year-old intelligence reports to the stack of documents on his desk. Next to his typewriter lay a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf in German, and transcripts of recent speeches by leading Nazi officials. He picked up his pen to add to the notes he had drafted for what would be the world's first published warning of Hitler's plans for worldwide genocide. He flipped through the pages of the file from the vault until he found the words he had typed when he was secret agent A12. He translated the German shouts he remembered from listening undercover on the first secret Nazis in Berlin. Hatred, revenge, uncompromising enmity. These must be our watchwords. Then he reread the words he had shared with his 1919 readers, men and women with top secret clearance. They know very well that Germany is herself in no position to gratify this desire. The reactionaries know that their hour is not yet come. The more far-seeing would wait a long time. Two decades later, Bell felt no better that he had been proven right. Now he needed to make up for lost time. Bell had not read Mein Kampf when it came out in 1925 because he was busy teaching philosophy at Harvard University. But once he brought his full intelligence to the Nazi code in March 1939, reading between the lines of Mein Kampf and recent statements by leading Nazi officials, cracking it was surprisingly easy. Hitler could not come right out and say what he meant to do with conquered populations because it would provoke overwhelming opposition. So he and his top readers spoke he and his top leaders spoke in a secret language that made the plan clear to their fellow racists while leaving everyone else in the dark. For instance, Hitler cleverly pointed his followers to ancient historical examples in which conquerors had slaughtered defeated populations. Bell, as expert in history as he was in the German language, saw the implication that Hitler left unstated. 
by piecing together historical clues with other data, Bell deciphered a secret message that had fooled the world for 14 years. But revealing the Nazis' hidden intentions was the easy part. It remained a far greater challenge to convince others that the German Fuhrer seriously meant to obliterate all non-Aryans and that the scope of his plan extended far beyond Germany and even Europe. It would be a difficult picture to paint. In late April, he was still at work writing his warning. His diary recorded him pruning trees and then listening to Weber's Oberon Overture, Haydn's Oxford Symphony, and Brahms's first on the radio. He made cocoa during the Brahms intermission, but distracted by his conversation with his wife, Brahms was vigorously played but too rushed in many places, he told her. He accidentally used salt instead of sugar. Then he sat back down to work, but once in a while, he he looked out at a heavy spring snow that made the view from his office beautiful. Eventually, he turned to his typewriter, which stood solemnly at the center of his desk. The repairman had visited on April 21st to ensure it was in top form. First rate again, Bell noted after months of wretched functioning. The tuned and oiled machine stood ready to fight the Nazis. He rolled a sheet of paper into position. The room transformed from silence to the machine gun fire of his practice typing. In the spring before the war was launched, the murderous final solution to the Jewish question still had no name. The Fuhrer described it only by hints and implications. Bell named it Hitler's extermination program, and its scope, he typed, was worldwide. This was the first clear warning of a strange fact that most people still do not realize today. Hitler and his allies meant to destroy all non-Aryan races on every inhabited continent of Earth. By the end of the Second World War, the Nazis had killed approximately 20 million innocent people, not including combat deaths. That was far short of the number they had hoped to kill. Even before the war began, Bell knew they aimed to massacre hundreds of millions. And yet, as the Holocaust historian Jürgen Matthäus notes, in September 1939, no one, not even seasoned observers of pre-war terror, had a clear idea what the Nazi regime's next step toward its goal of solving the Jewish question would be. And in her book, Beyond Belief, The American Press and the Coming of the Holocaust, Deborah Lipstadt shows that there are no known earlier warnings about the final solution in English language newspapers. Before 1942, she explains, journalists understood Nazi extermination to mean cultural extermination involving mm. deportations of Jews and occasional murders to frighten other Jews out of Germany. She writes, no one could imagine even in 1941 that it would soon take on an even more diabolical meaning as the systematic and complete murder of European Jewry. And as Andrew Nagorski writes in Hitlerland, people had no inkling of the Nazi plan, even though today he writes, it's conventional wisdom that Hitler's intentions were perfectly clear from the outset and that his policies could only result in World War II and the Holocaust. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, American visitors to Germany did not see Hitler's ultimate purpose. For those who met him, Nagorski writes, he was not some abstract embodiment of evil, but a real life politician. But Bell knew, and he alone in early 1939 knew enough to give a startlingly accurate warning that Hitler meant to kill all Jews and non-Aryan peoples everywhere in the world. Agent A-12's clear view at a time when the Nazis proclaimed a desire for peace, no doubt owed to his close-up observation of the Nazis in 1919. He had seen their hidden essence months before Hitler was even a player in the movement. And now, two decades later, Bell realized that their race war would not stop with the Jews. Next on their hit list were peoples like the Poles, Ukrainians, French, Russians, Czechs, Slovaks, Asians, and Blacks. All non-Aryans, he typed, were to be quite literally exterminated. And that is an emphasis in, uh, in italics uh, in his original, quite literally exterminated. Mm. 
This was, in Hitler's depraved imagination, the only way to protect German blood from racial poisoning. Hitler's European policy, Bell typed, is thus merely the first stage. Hitler planned to murder non-Aryans in North America just as surely as he meant to destroy them in Europe. Bell knew that if the Nazis won the war, SS troops would one day be in Nova Scotia to round up the Jews and other minorities, as well as liberals like him. But this time, unlike 1919, he had an important advantage. Now he was no longer a professional spy, but a private individual. No clueless government bureaucrats could censor him. That's my prologue. Uh, and now I'd like to read uh, an intellectual biography of Bell with special reference to his uh, intelligence work. One pivotal figure has remained unnoticed in World War II history until now. Recently declassified papers reveal that Dr. Winthrop Bell was key to winning World War II by providing the first warnings about the Nazis and thwarting their earliest battle plans. As an undercover operative in Germany, Bell gave the first warnings of the nascent Nazi ideology in early 1919. Months before Adolf Hitler was a player in the movement, Bell warned of Nazi plans for race war. In 1919, Bell described how the extremists planned to target Jews and team up with Russia, Japan, and Italy to fight a war of revenge. His report was an eerily prescient warning of the birth of the Axis and the future consequences of failure to take immediate action to prevent it. Two decades later, in spring 1939, Bell wrote the first intel alert of Hitler's plan for the Holocaust, and later that year published it in a leading Canadian news weekly, Saturday Night. It was the first warning of the years. In 1919, Bell wanted to warn the West to eradicate the Nazis before they became powerful, but the plot he described seemed to some too incredible to be true. Still, his warnings were sufficient to raise the alarm among far-sighted people like the chiefs of MI6. Britain was sufficiently worried about the Nazis to rearm to counter them. Without Bell, the Nazis might have won the war. Nearly six feet tall, Bell was a handsome, dark blonde, blue-eyed philosopher, outdoorsman, engineer, and businessman. Before beginning his espionage career, he was a railway surveyor in the inhospitable northern Canadian forests and served on Emanuel College's row team at Cambridge University. But he wasn't just muscles and rugged backstory. A New Brunswick newspaper described his amazing capacity for hard work and studious, friendly, gracious, attractive personality. The famous German philosopher Edmund Husserl called him brilliant. Bell was born in 1884 in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and raised in a prosperous, academically inclined family. His father, owner of a successful ship outfitting business, was a genial, humble man who gladly stood against injustice. Winthrop's mother, a perfectionist unto exhaustion, studied music in Boston before teaching piano in Sackville. The parental tendencies to perfect perfectionism, humility, geniality, musical appreciation, and righteous anger combined in their son. After graduating with honors from prestigious Mount Allison University in Sackville, in 1908, Bell came to Harvard to study philosophy with leading representatives of the pragmatic movement. The method taught a middle position between self-certain absolutism and skepticism, that the world is full of problems and thinking is designed to solve them. It was a lesson he took to heart when he became a spy. He was planning to become a philosophy professor at Harvard when he arrived at Göttingen, Germany in 1911 to become the first Anglophone doctoral student of Husserl, the renowned leader of phenomenology. Philosophy had been divided between the idealists who think the important thing are the essences and the empiricists who think that the important thing are the appearances. Phenomenology showed how to get to the essential 
through appearances. Bell was making his final dissertation revisions when Britain entered the Great War in August 1914. As a British subject, he was arrested. Still worse, his doctorate was withdrawn. But then things became much worse. Based on a misheard conversation, he fell under suspicion as a spy and was subjected to harsh interrogations. He was eventually judged innocent and ended up, like the other British civilian prisoners, in Ruleben Prison Camp, a former horse racing track where the men were housed in stables six to a horse stall. Despite armed guards, barbed wire, mud, and crowded, noisy conditions, the camp had its upsides. The prisoners were allowed to organize themselves and use their own funds to import goods needed for camp shops, organized sports, cultural activities, and even a university. Because the prisoners included academics, musicians, and athletes caught in Germany at the outbreak of war, they created a thriving leisure scene with musical performances, drama, film, and competitive sports. Bell taught philosophy and history at Ruhleben Camp School, also called Ruhleben University, distinguished institutions such as Oxford, Edinburgh, and the University of London later recognized Ruhleben credits. For a future World War II anti-Nazi intelligence agent, Ruhleben was like a four-year espionage preparatory course paid for by the German government. It gave Bell opportunities to hone his German language skills and understand the nuances of the German mindset and political situation at a level of detail impossible in any other country. Living near Berlin also meant that Bell stayed near his friends with sensitive positions in German military intelligence. Interestingly, Bell was not the only Ruhleben inmate to end up with the British Secret Service. His prison team hockey rival was John Cecil Masterman, who orchestrated the World War II double crop operation that used double agents to convince Hitler that the D-Day invasion would happen at Pas de Calais rather than Normandy. At war's end, amidst the revolution, Bell spent weeks in Berlin having conversations with his key sources. Through the sound of gunshots, he learned that despite political turmoil and Germany's starvation, the people were extremely hopeful about their democratic future. But dangerous forces lurked in the background, including powerful racist warlords like General Eric Ludendorff. Soon Bell was in London where he met with the Canadian Prime Minister Sir Robert Borden, a family friend. Bell explained the German situation and told Borden a surprising fact. A leading German faction had fought the Great War as a race war. That faction was now marginalized and the pro-democratic majority was in charge. But democracy was on unstable footing. Bell warned they could not remain in power for long if conditions remained desperate. Militant communists and racist nationalists waited in the wings. And to secure friendly relations between Germany and the Allies to save democracy and starve the extremists of recruits. Borden made introductions and MI6 soon wanted to hire Bell as an agent. But owing to post-war austerity, the Secret Service was virtually broke. The legendary C, MI6's chief and founder, Sir Mansfield Smith Cumming, was needing to lay off many of his best agents who had risked their lives in the service. Fortunately, a solution was found. Canada, with its immense national resources, would cover Bell's salary, providing a handsome pay that would let him wine and dine Germany's most important citizens in style. The Canadian became Britain's newest secret agent. He was assigned cover as a Reuters reporter and sent to Berlin, a once orderly city now turned into a deadly web of intrigue. Communists, nationalists, and Democrats vied for the country's soul. 
not one to do things by half measures, Bell took his cover job as journalist seriously. His dispatches went to both MI6 and to English language newspapers throughout the world. His risky trips to the telegraph office, sometimes sprinting through raging urban battles featuring tanks, machine guns, artillery, airplanes, and poison gas, gave readers a lifetime description of Germany's descent into madness. Some journalists, he complained, stayed safe in their luxurious hotels, writing stories based on propagandistic news releases. But Bell knew he needed to take the risk of getting shot to deliver the unvarnished truth about German desperation. He wouldn't be able to convince Britain's political leaders to act unless their voting public was swayed. And it was still popular to be anti-German, owing to resentment about the war. Bell's reports, informed by sources like the future Nobel Prize winning physicist Albert Einstein, were key to finally ending the Allied food blockade of Germany that continued into 1919. A misnomer holds that the war stopped with the November 1918 armistice, but that was only a ceasefire. The violence continued, but with slow starvation rather than artillery fire. The blockade remained in place until March 1919, when Bell's first-hand descriptions of starving children and desperate mothers helped turn the tide of public opinion. Something like a quarter of a million Germans died of starvation and related diseases between November 19 and March 1919. Einstein, who had good connections within the German government, said that the food was about to run out and the situation was going to turn cataclysmic, uh, meaning millions of deaths if the blockade were not lifted. Bell urged that extending a helping hand to German democracy was better than letting the country fall under the control of the extremists. Desperate economic conditions made for easy recruiting by extremist militias. Along with Borden and C, Bell had a growing number of allies in the quest, including the powerful British spymaster Lord Morris Hankey, influential figures at Versailles like Lord Robert Cecil, and directors of prominent financial institutions, including the Bank of England, Lloyds, and Barclays. Bell also swayed the UK Prime Minister David Lloyd George through personal briefings. After meeting Bell on March 26, 1919, the Prime Minister was converted to a more merciful plan for the Versailles Peace Treaty. Unfortunately, the American President Woodrow Wilson had a change of heart in the opposite direction towards France's proposal for harsh terms meaning that of the big three, the vote remained two to one in favor of harsh justice and against mercy. Still, the British negotiators mitigated the punishment. For instance, after being briefed by Bell, Lloyd George shocked France and the United States by saying that if Germany refused to sign the draft treaty without changes and the Allies invaded, Britain wouldn't join them. The shift happened because Bell's intel had given Lloyd George a considerable fright. Not amending the draft treaty would mean war. If German Silesia, among the country's richest land, were handed over to Poland, as the draft treaty planned, war would begin immediately. But there was an easy way to keep the peace. Bell urged letting Silesians vote on which country they wanted to join, Germany or Poland, who could argue against democracy. France finally relented and the vote was scheduled. Bell's idea prevented a war that could have killed hundreds of thousands. In the spring of 1919, with the help of his pro-democratic sources and German military intelligence, Bell described the birth of Nazi ideology. The reactionary right and elements of the Soviet left joined forces as National Socialism with the reactionaries in the driver's seat. The unholy marriage happened at the Eden Hotel, headquarters of the violent right-wing Freikorps forces. Before the negotiations at Eden, mediated by the German spymaster Baron von Schenk, Militant nationalism and communism had been at each other's throats, 
and democracy stayed in charge. But together, the extremists were the strongest military force in the country. Hitler's National Socialist German Workers' Party, named in 1920, was merely a step in the plot, not its origin. In late 1919, Germany's situation became still more dire. By the fall, Bell warned that the Nazis were the strongest organization in Germany and could take over the country any time they wanted. They just didn't want to yet because the country's economic position was hopeless. In October 1919, Bell uncovered ambitious Nazi attack plans against Riga, Latvia, the gateway to the Baltics with a 100,000-man army. He alerted Britain, which sent warships to bombard the invaders. Meanwhile, Bell cooperated with Germany's democratic authorities to defund the mercenaries and block arms transfers to the east. The Baltic invasion was led by high-ranking German officers. This gave Britain the impression that it was an official government plot. If so, the Allies had reason to restart the blockade and the war. But Bell intercepted a message written by a mercenary officer proving it was the reactionary faction behind the attack, not the official German government. The defeat of the Nazis at Riga was one of MI6's greatest victories. Yet in the clandestine style favored by the Secret Service, it was so quietly effective that it has gone virtually unnoticed in history. Despite thwarting the Baltic invasion, Bell realized that the Nazis wouldn't stop until they won or were utterly destroyed. He created a two-part plan to destroy them at their home base in Berlin. The military side was comparatively easy, helping German democracy disband powerful militias. The financial side would be more difficult. Bell's plan would create a partnership among the Allies, neutral nations, and private financiers to supply credits so that German industry could restart. That in turn would create work for millions of unemployed soldiers who were otherwise hired as mercenaries. Profits from German industry would mean tax revenue to fund German democracy. Then credits would be repaid with interest and investors would make a fortune. The world's economy would be placed on firm footing and Germany would become a close friend of Britain. Yet, despite support from prominent quarters and official Britain, Influential conservatives like the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Austin Chamberlain, blocked his proposal. Chamberlain complained that Germany's credits would be spent buying materials from the United States. It jealous pang to the empire's conscience. Chamberlain's refusal meant continued instability, paving the way for the Nazi rise to power. And yet Bell's warning of a secret German army with something like a million troops ran in English speaking newspapers all over the world, just as with his warnings of a growing anti-Semitic movement in Germany. The warning helped Britain be more wary than their neighbors during the Nazi rise to power. Winston Churchill, for instance, early 1920 went before parliament with news of the secret German army uh, and scared his fellow parliamentarians who were uh, voting to lower the number of the United Kingdom's armed forces to only a quarter million, meaning they would have been outgunned a four to one. Frustrated by the inaction about his report in the first month of the year, Bell resigned his Secret Service position in early 1920. In 1922, Dr. Bell took a, a position as philosophy instructor at Harvard and married Hazel Deinstadt, a fellow Nova Scotian and former war nurse in France. Owing to prudent investments and careful saving, he retired from teaching and business pursuits before the age of 50. The Bells moved to Chester, Nova Scotia and a life of service and contemplation. In 1934, as Hitler seized absolute power in Germany, 
Bell undertook his next intelligence mission into Germany. This time, it was a mission for two. Hazel went with him. In Göttingen, Bell met often with his top anti-Nazi source, Wilhelm Runga, a chief scientist in Germany's world-leading military radar program. Runga is a crucial but hitherto unnoticed figure in the Nazi defeat. Beginning with the Nazi rise to power and continuing through World War II, he used his leadership position to undermine Nazi radar from within. His sabotage transformed a seemingly insurmountable Nazi radar lead before the war into a hopeless debacle by the end. Because radar superiority made a fundamental difference in the Battle of Britain, the value of his operation is virtually incalculable. In the spring of 1939, Bell cracked the Nazi secret plan for racial extermination and sent the revelation to his intelligence contacts. Later that year, the Newsweekly Saturday Night published Bell's warnings under the headlines, Exterminate Non-Germans, Dogma of Mein Kampf, and Hitler's extermination policy is worldwide. Bell understood the Nazis meant to kill all non-Aryans, including Jews, Slavs, Blacks, and Asians, everywhere in the world. Hitler's European policy, he wrote in Saturday Night, is merely the first stage. Bell's Holocaust warning was the earliest by years. The next appeared in secret intelligence files in 1941 and in the press in 1942. Hitler's plan required utmost secrecy, but Bell was the first to lift the veil. It is difficult to precisely calculate the impact of Bell's 1939 warning. But we know that among the intelligence contacts he alerted early in the year was his American friend Francis Dayak, who was a principal figure in The Pond, predecessor organization of the CIA, as well as the OSS and the U.S. State Department. The U.S. executive branch, despite congressional opposition, contributed to British defense in the early stages of the war during America's official neutrality which may have owed to Bell's early warning. Something similar can be said about the policy of demand demanding Germany's unconditional surrender. Asking for surrender without any conditions would in ordinary times be inhumane. But the Nazi plot for worldwide genocide left no alternative. After the war, Bell retired once again and took up writing history and reading detective stories. It was fitting leisure for one of history's greatest secret detectives. He died in Chester, Nova Scotia on April 4, 1965, in his home by the sea. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, well, brilliant stuff. Um, lots to unpack, Jason. Um, and I think myself and the sidebar, we're reeling with the amount of information that came in there. So um, I'll start with a with a question about his abilities because he clearly was very very good at the spy game what what do you think made him so good at that um is you know and then we'll move on to the why people are not listening to him necessarily but what what skill it seems to me i mean he was physically fit he was tall he was imposing he was charming but that doesn't necessarily make you good at um keeping your ear to the ground what, what how would you how would you um describe that ability Sure. Well, I think some of it was his academic training. So at, at Mount Allison, for instance, he had been trained in, in mathematics uh, and history. Then he went to McGill and he was trained in engineering. Uh, then he was trained in, in philosophy, uh, psychology. So so he how a lot of these things work. And then, of course, he went to, to Germany and he became an expert in German with native level fluency. Uh, so it was a really diverse education that was required for him. Also, I think his phenomenology was important. So phenomenology is the art of faithful description uh, after carefully removing bias. Uh, and that sounds easy to do, but in fact, it's incredibly difficult to, to get rid of bias and really see what something is in itself. Uh, so later in, the, in 1919, Bell was the first British agent in Germany. Later in the year, others started coming in and they were all convinced uh, that they were there to fight in impending communist takeover of, of Germany. 
and they just viewed everything through that lens and it was hard for them to see uh, anything else. Uh, but Bell was able to, to, to keep his eye on the actual object of, of what Germany was in front of him. Uh, you mentioned, you know, he, he was a charming fellow. This was really key. Uh, he was charming. I should also say he was deeply loyal. His sources mm -hmm. trusted him with their lives, and he had many prominent sources who would have absolutely been killed by Nazi assassins if they knew what what uh, he was telling, uh, what, what 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 he was doing with this information. Uh, but he was somebody who was would have protected his sources with his with his life, uh, and they trusted him, and 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 they knew that. So his pragmatism was key. So he wasn't just thinking about about describing a problem, but he was constantly thinking uh, about how to solve it. Um, and this is all to say he he was not thinking when he was getting all this education, uh, but it was really training him perfectly uh, for what he was going to do. And actually, one other thing I should mention is uh, at the University of Göttingen in Germany, it was the leading math and, and physics university in Germany. When he was a graduate student, he quite innocently befriended uh, his fellow students, who among them were future Nobel Prize winners, when World War I broke out, uh, the powers that be in Germany realized that these men should not be lost in the trenches. They instead sent them into military intelligence. Uh, and those became among Bell's uh, very key sources during uh, during this time period. They, they and Some of them certainly knew he was working for the British government. Uh, and they were feeding him information because they wanted to get rid of the Nazis. This was a pro-democratic group within Germany. They knew that that Bell wanted to help them out. Uh, they were not, you know, permitted, but for reasons of honor, to kill their fellow officers who are Nazis. But uh, there was no rule against supplying the information that would let uh, let the British Royal Navy, for instance, do it. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm just going to deal with some questions, kind of in a random way. They've come in because you you talked about those early reports you were saying about the eventual um, uh, extermination of anybody who was non-Aryan. So James is asking. What would Bell's classification have been of of Aryan from his from his point of view? I mean, because it's one of those words that it, it, it's it's used differently. What what would Bell's definition be? Well, he he actually said in his 1939 warnings that that Hitler himself was vague on this, right? Uh, so we we couldn't tell tell what that meant. But but Bell said um, it seemed, for instance, not to include the French. Uh, because they were a, in Hitler's language, a Negroid people. Uh, so once upon a time they were Aryan, but through intermarriage they'd stop being Aryan. Uh, likewise with people in Austria who Hitler detested for having intermarried with Slavs. Uh, so it was it was clear that some people were definitely not Aryan. So you know, you know blacks were out and Asians were yeah. out. That did not preclude the possibility the Nazis would, for for practical reasons, ally with these people so that they could defeat the West. Uh, but it was clear from from Hitler's doctrine of race poison that he eventually meant to meant, meant to get rid of those people as well. Uh, and Hitler was certainly fond of people like the Swedes, uh, the you know the English. Uh, so these would have all counted as uh, as as Aryans in in, in his book. Uh, but but as said, uh, you know, Bell said it was Hitler himself was never quite clear on what he meant by this. So we can't do a, a precise calculation of how many people he did want to murder. Although it was certainly in the hundreds of millions. And likely over a billion at a time the, the Earth's population was about two billion. Mm. Well, thank you. And and people are thinking, you know, that what would the true definition be? The dictionary, the dictionary definition. I think I suppose people can look that up, and it would have changed over over time as well. Is the what it meant and what was inferred by it? I think is another subject. But so I think, but rather than getting into that kind of debate about the, the linguistic nature of that, it's that the other thing is that of course, lots of people were in. Germany in 1919. Lots of people were there. That we've, we've done shows on this channel and World War One TV about the Treaty of Versailles. Mike Nyberg's been on, other people like that. So, you know, we're, one of the things that didn't kind of come up in the conversation because why would it? Is Bolshevism is absolutely on the rise. So, how many people in Germany do you think were just completely blinded by the by what was happening east, and and therefore? the rise of what we now refer to the Nazis was just sort of happening in the, in the background of that. Well, that, that was the, the, the main concern. And you could tell, you know, Bell knew his audience and he was constantly writing for, for people, not only in MI6, but the British government who were convinced that was the threat Bolshevism. Uh, Bell from the beginning, from his very first reports, this was late, uh, late 1918 was saying that the militant, arm of Bolshevism uh, was not powerful in Germany. 
Uh, and that was because of some mistakes they had made in, during the revolution. Uh, so one of the mistakes was that they had the, the extreme left uh, had distributed rifles and and those were used to shoot at German troops, which made uh, made the German military hate the Bolshevik, Bolshevists. And then they took over uh, offices in, in the, the, the official in, in, in government buildings and pretended that they were the government of Germany, uh, which made the Social Democrats hate them. So Bell said this was really a marginalized group. Uh, they didn't have real support in the country. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the population supported democracy. And that wasn't to say there were not a lot of uh, uh, Bolsheviks. Uh, there, there were something like you know something like a million uh, a million troops with weapons, but they didn't have organization. Uh, even though the the, the right wing Fry Corps was much much smaller, maybe about one tenth of the size, they were they had organization. They were able to go into city after city after city uh, and defeat the Bolsheviks. Uh, and Bell said in in a March report that this battle would be decided by by April of 1919. He said. Uh, some kind of socialism was going to take over. The question was whether it was going to be uh, the left-wing socialism or whether it was going to be uh, militant socialism. So, in other words, whether you know the whether the, the workers' councils would control things or uh, control the means of production or whether the military would. Uh, and by April 1919, it was um, it was it was clear, clear. He said that that the the right-wing socialists had the upper hand. Um, and he he so he called them uh, he called them tended to call them the Soviets. And it's kind of a bit hard to think about these days, but uh, these were, you know, right-wing Soviets uh, who were who, who were in favor of uh, socialization. But this is what had happened in World War One, when the when the German military under Ludendorff uh, had taken control of the means of production mm -hmm. uh, under itself, and that was the big fight. Really, was among was between the right-wing officers and the left-wing uh, soldiers about you know who were going to be the ones who were going to own the means of production. Uh, but through the early part of 1919, but Bell was saying you know, he saw the rise in current, but he said, you know, it's it's still going to be easy to wipe this out because we have the the vast majority of the public on our side. OK, thank you. So um, moving back to Bell and these reports he was doing very early on, recognizing this. I mean, you you you, you dropped some incredible names, you know, Lloyd uh, not George and um, and we, you know, Niels Bohr came into the conversation. I mean, he he, he was moving in the right circles. Um, and his, his reports were getting to the right places, but clearly not enough attention was, be, was, was being paid to them. Because, I'm, as again, I said earlier, there's lots of information coming out, German, out of Germany. You know, why is it, would it have been expecting too much to have predicted the complete horrors of the Third Reich? Because we, we now know it happened. We now know that, you know, 11 million people were murdered. But that would have seemed crazy. At, a, at an era just coming out of the Great War, when people were believing that's it now, humankind have been the worst they're ever going to be. It's all, the future is bright, the future is rosy. Um, you, what's your explanation for not enough attention being 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 paid to them? Sure. Well, I, I think um, you know I, I I make the point in the book that that Bell's uh, anti-Nazi plan to to destroy the Nazis was one signature away from being accepted. Right. Uh, so it needed the Foreign Office to sign off on this. David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of the UK, had made clear that he would sign off on this. Uh, so, so Bell had convinced absolutely key people that David Lloyd George mm. was was running a grand coalition government with, between the uh, between liberals and 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 the conservatives, uh, and the conservatives were insisting on a radical decrease in uh, in expenditures. So there was going to be a cost associated with with Bell's plan. It meant uh, getting some financial help to uh, to Germany, uh, and that required a signature for, from from Austin Chamberlain, and, and he refused to provide it. Um, with that said, I mean there there was an awareness that there there was evil in the air. So, um, mm -hmm. so something like a hundred thousand a uh, hundred thousand Jews were slaughtered in Ukraine in 1919. Uh, the New York Times warned that if these uh, reactionaries succeeded in taking over the East, it would mean the death of two to four million Jews. Uh, so there were already um, there, there were obviously clearly genocidal plans underway, and Britain understood this at at least at a certain level. Um, now there were people like Austin Chamberlain uh, and Lord Harding who rejected Bell's plan. I don't think they read it. I think they, they they kind of you know saw the you know he headline you know cost of this, 
uh, I think Lord Harding, for instance, was was snookered by uh, the, the right wing extremists in Germany claiming that they were an anti uh, communist front. Uh, and Bell's reports, if he had read them, if, if Harding and other people had read them, he would have known that uh, that was a lie, that, th that this was not uh, an anti communist movement. Uh, it was it was purely had a racial basis. Uh, so it's clear from clues that you can see uh, about things that were being written about Bell's reports in, in MI6 at the time. Uh, that there was a clear, clear awareness of what was at stake, uh, and what mm. was at stake here was was the the, the death of, of potentially mil millions of uh, of innocent peoples. I mean that that's the that's the the smoking gun. In, in, it's not an appropriate phrase, really, but that you know that plenty of people were warning that the situation in Germany was confused, complicated. We've done shows on the channel before talking about you know the whole how many whatever it was the Frank McDonald's figure of thirty two different types of government in a matter of. 12 years or something crazy it was at one point there and uh, and you know four four parties coalitions at the same time that were weren't la were lasting more than weeks but but a, a fragile fractured system is one warning the a predicting the actual extermination of entire races was was maybe where he was 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 unique in that regard and that that involved clearly a huge amount of foresight but also just just um to 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 think of the very worst in people as a as a philosopher as a trained philosopher you're, you're, are you looking for meaning in life you're looking for the best in humankind he 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 obviously realized that we human beings can be really shitty a shitty species absolutely well, i should say another thing about phenomenology was uh, one of its specialties was the logical analysis of intentions right uh, and the idea here was uh, he was just trying to figure out what this nazi intention was and I should say, in, in 1919, he was saying that the that the Nazis intended race war. He he pointed out in his, his warnings that went out to Reuters that this meant that uh, Jews were already being attacked on the streets uh, in a well-organized campaign a, across Germany. This was Kristallnacht, uh, you know, decades before the time. Yeah. Uh, there were posters going up that said, kill the Jews. Uh, but in 1919, he did not yet say this was going to be, uh, you know, what we later came to, to know as as the Holocaust or the actual extermination of the entire race. Uh, so it was going to be a war, but he didn't yet know what that meant. It wasn't until 1939 that he that he, uh, after reading Hitler's Mein Kampf, that he uh, put together what he had yeah, seen in 1919. Yeah. That's right. And then he said clearly, yes, this does mean worldwide exterminations. But you know, but you know, but, and it came up in a sidebar earlier that there are even escaped people from concentration facilities in 1943 saying what's happening and people were still not believing it even halfway through the war so to be able to to, to predict in not in 1939 this is going to happen is 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 so far ahead of the game it's extraordinary yeah, absolutely and one of the kind of the, the you know, key smoking gun things that are, that's in my uh in my book is a is a letter from francis dayak of the u.s state department in 1939 uh, he'd received Bell's warning in, in the spring of 1939. He wrote him a letter, which at that point, which unfortunately is lost, but later that year, after the Nazi invasion of Poland, he wrote Bell another letter, and he said, uh, you know, something to the effect of, uh, "Your predictions have proven accurate, given what's happening in Poland." So, so the next war, the, the next known uh, uh, acknowledgments in, in secret documents that there were racial exterminations going on wasn't until 1941. But here's the U.S. State Department, or at least a figure in the State Department saying at the tail end of 1939 that uh, there were racial exterminations going on led by the Germans. Well, thank you. And we will kind of bring things to end fairly soon. But my last question really is about, it's a crass interviewer's question, but I feel it's the right time to ask it. In, in that what are your hopes for this? Because it's part spy thriller. It's part um, study of a, an incredible intellectual. And it's, and it's also kind of a warning about politics and and not seeing what's coming so it's all those things and more so i mean who, who is it aimed for what who who do you think are reading it you've been you're in the middle of a book tour right now um what what how would you classify it? i mean because I, I haven't actually got a copy of it yet but where where, where shall i put it on my shelf that's one of the questions i ask people is i don't know where does it go with the spy shelf does it go with the kind of the the rise of the nazis where, where, where would you where would you put your book on my shelf <laughs> Uh, well, it's for you to buy multiple copies. You can put it in multiple places on your, Good on your idea. shelf. But uh, it, it's it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a World War One story. It's a World War Two story. It's it's a spy story. Um, I mean, I think that really the, there's two take-home messages. And one is he said um, that that 
he said that British people have a hard time taking extremism seriously. Right. Uh, so even in, in the 1930s, when Hitler was beginning in more open ways to say these things, uh, Bell in his 1939 report said people just kept on reading him in some other way. They said, oh, Hitler's just saying this because he wants votes. Once he gets a position of power, he's going to turn into a moderate. And they were thinking of Hitler as being, you know, something like a British politician, right? Who would, uh, you know, he's like secretly a reasonable guy. Um, and I think we can see, you know, similar things nowadays. There have been, you know, re recent, you know, you know, genocidal attacks on Jews. And then we read, oh, years ago, the leaders of the, these genocides saying, you know, we want to get rid of all Jews. And mm. people just couldn't quite take that seriously. Um, I think the, the other take home message of, of Bell uh, is that one really needs to have a plan for peace while a war is being fought that can be announced even during the war and, and to be ready to move on it. And he was saying in 1919, you know, even if we'd had the Versailles peace treaty terms as harsh as they were, and we could have imposed those right away, things would have been fine. But instead in that whole period of uncertainty and starvation, the Nazis were using uh, the hunger and uncertainty for recruitment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think for instance, you know, now we just like, you know, we haven't learned our lesson. Like we don't see in, in current, uh, you know, conflicts, uh, in Russia and Palestine, for instance, you know, what would it look like if, you know, the, the West and, and good hearted people in, in, in the East as well uh, wanted to support, uh, you know, the people of Palestine, the people of Russia, uh, you know, with a good plan for peace, that would mean that they would be heartened to remove the extremist in their in their midst, and then to be able to follow up on it. And as it is, it's just, you know, it's a lot more interesting for us to read about war than to think about the kind of you know, the boring stuff about finance after, you know, afterwards. And there's obviously an expense that's attached to this, but I think what Bell's story shows is that it's a whole lot cheaper to be able to provide that financial aid uh, that would prevent further wars than needing to actually spend all the money and, and the lives uh, in fighting a war. It's the, it's the old, um, we talked about it on uh, earlier this uh, week, well, World War One TV, when we were talking about um, the British, uh, Robert Lyman, the British Army failing to prepare after its incredible victory in 1918 for the next war and saying that, it should have gone fully comprehensive on its insurance. It only went third party fire and theft. And it, it, the same kind of thing at the end of the First World War is that they're looking for a, 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 the, the cheaper insurance policy where and a really expensive insurance policy might just. And Robert Lyman is convinced that there was, he was saying in 1936 even, there was a real route to preventing World War II. If only we had invested in it um, and, and we didn't at our, at our collective um, uh, uh, fault. That's right. Yeah. And, I, and I've noticed that my final comment is that, you know, in doing my prep for this is that people are you, you've been on various uh, shows and podcasts is people are using the Bell story to, as you said yourself, to 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 look at look at what's happening in Ukraine, Middle East. It's it's a it's a it's a, a warning about the future as well as being a fascinating biography of a guy who's now was working. Well, you know, literally we're talking 100 years more in the past. These these warnings were coming our way. And yet it seems insanely and unfortunately sadly uh, relevant today in 2023 absolutely but i i really think you know and one of the reasons i put you know so much work into this book is i don't think it's just a story about history but i think it's a it's a story about how we can do things better in the future and if if we understand this i i, I make the argument in the book that bell gave us the marshall plan or at least the intellectual foundations of it mm. that's a time in history that we got it right with the marshall plan but that was a once off. We need to you know, look at that model, not just as a historical model, but think of how we can replicate this in each conflict in the future. And then I think we'll find there's a lot less conflicts to fight. Yeah. Well, we will leave it there. And I will just leave it with the, the good luck with the book. Although Brad over in Canada is saying it's selling very well over there. It's getting on all the, the Canadian news shows and, and, and morning shows. So it's, it's, it's clearly come out at a convenient time for marketing. If, if that doesn't, you know, good for you bad for the rest of the world but yeah it's been an enlightening pre uh, presentation i've learned a lot and it's one of the ones that leaves me with more questions in my mind than than answers which is the best type of world war ii tv show because there's so many what ifs and variables in this story of uh, of, of lessons unlearned unfortunately which is i guess 
that is what history is all about. Where well, the 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 um the the failure to keep to, to to learn from the past. But anyway, it's been brilliant talking to you, Jason. Good luck with the book. If you come back and do something else, another book about World War Two or World War One, we'll invite you back again. And folks, that's me done for a few days because I'm off to uh, Budapest and Prague to do some more stuff there. Look out for some Woody's walkabouts. I'm hopefully doing some live stuff from over there. But in the meantime, keep on watching the back catalogue. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, viewers. I will see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye.